Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach, and tonight we're going to be talking about uh, a number of essays by famous anarchists. The first couple of them are going to be from David Graeber. For those who may be new to this particular stream, uh, I like to do a theory stream every Friday night at 7 p.m. until 9 or 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. And then on Sundays, I like to do a stream on kind of whatever. I think I'll probably be continuing on with my, my series on, on Permaculture 101, getting people up to speed on permaculture theory. I feel it's a very important uh, set of, of ethics and, and principles that can be incorporated into any sort of leftist movement and, and make it stronger. So that's not just for the liberation of people, but uh, they're thriving into future generations and for the liberation of basically all, li all living things, you know, not, not just the, the human animal, right? So, uh, as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. As long as you're asking in good faith, I'm always happy to entertain. And I'm by no means an expert. I, j I just like listening to theory and, and thinking about it. Um, and myself, I, I do consider myself to be an anarchist of, of some variety. Usually I say anarcho-communist because uh, of all the books I've read, I think I align most with, with Peter Kropotkin's uh, The Conquest of Bread in his theories, but, you know, that may change as, as I adjust and, and get exposed to new things as well. So uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind, that we're, we're all on a journey. None of us starts, or well, virtually none of us start out as any, fo any form of leftist. I mean, it's very rare to be born into a, a very strict leftist household. So most of us are coming from probably liberalism, uh, perhaps even further right than that. So... You know, I, I try to keep that in mind when I'm dealing with people and, you know, not be condescending or smug about it, but, but just realize that, like I said, we're all on a journey. And if I can be one more person to help you down the road, then, then you know, I feel my, my job is complete. So, yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and put my follow link into the chat right now so you can check out me on all the different platforms. Yep, that should have been... Okay. So there you go. That's that's my link tree to all the different places that you can find me on Twitch. I archive this stream on YouTube as, as well as as a podcast in auto, audio only form, of course, uh, that I put out through Anchor and then gets distributed to all the, the various platforms. Uh, I also run a couple of groups on Facebook that, that deal with leftist content and promoting it. And... Uh, and yeah, I have a few things going on besides that as well. So go check out that link tree and, and you can contact me. And, and uh, I always try to put out when I'm going live on both Facebook uh, through the Bread Theory page as, as well as on Twitter, at least. Um, so that if you, for whatever reason, didn't get that Twitch notification, hopefully you'll, you'll still be able to see it and, and come join the conversation. And hopefully the fun as well. We're going to go ahead and start off with... Uh, this one by David Graeber. He was a famous anarchist um, of, of recent, of the, the recent era. I mean, I believe he passed maybe just a uh, little more than a year ago. Unfortunately, uh, he, he would have had a long career otherwise, but, um, you know, tragedies befall people. So um, sadly, he's, he's, yeah, not with us anymore. But uh, so this, this one is just trying to lay some groundwork, get you thinking about, well, hey, maybe I do believe in this thing or that thing. Uh, perhaps I could explore more in the way of anarchy and anarchism. And, and, you know, important to mention right off the bat, anarchy doesn't just mean the absence of rule of law or state or any of that sort of thing. That's, that's chaos. That, that's just, uh, you know, the old conception of law of the jungle, which doesn't even match reality either. Uh, the law of the jungle, more often than not, is, is cooperation and specialization into niches rather than competition. Competition takes a lot of energy, and it's risky. Uh, so both people and, and other animals and plants and, and whatever tend to avoid it if they can and, and still, you know, make, live a... a, a uh, a healthy and, and good and full existence. So yeah, so, so anarchy means 
a lack of hierarchy. It's, it's an, which is not or none, and archy, which comes from hierarchy. So that means just no one is, is arbitrarily set above any other person especially without earning it. They, you know, they talk a lot in anarchy about just and unjust hierarchies. And the distinction there is, well, perhaps you have expertise. You're, you're a surgeon. It's not as though anyone can just jump in and perform surgery uh, with, a, you know, a couple minutes, you know, leafing through a, a manual or something like that. It, it, it's very highly specialized. It takes a lot of time and, and energy and, and will to, to become a surgeon. So in that case, if you were to step in and say, I can save this person through my surgical practice, that's, that's a just hierarchy. And then you would have people assisting you who may or may not have the same expertise as you, right? But as much as possible, trying to do away with hierarchies, having bosses, for example, um, or I, I, I shouldn't say bosses, but more like owners, like the, the, the owner of a company who may or may not be involved in the, the workings of the company directly may just sit back and, and collect a paycheck. Uh, usually no need for that sort of thing. Usually the workers can run the business as good of, as, if not better, than the owner themselves. Uh, it depends on the business, but, but that, that tends to be the case. So that's what anarchy is about. So let, let's hear what, what David Graeber is going to have to say. He's going to pose some questions to you about whether or not you too may be an anarchist. I'll make sure the closed captions on, looks like it is, and we'll start right now. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. And as, and as usual, I, I'm using Audible Anarchist on uh, YouTube. Very great resource. They have, they have tons of stuff that has been uh, converted into audio form. So, like for myself, since I work a, a landscaping job, I have a lot of time where I can just listen to things as I work with my hands. Uh, so that works out really well for me. It's, it's basically the only reason that I, or the only way that I'm able to, to read uh, as many books as I do per year. I try to do one per week. Don't always make that goal, but, but I, I try to. Uh, but if it was not for audiobooks, then I, I, I wouldn't make that goal at all because it's just not enough. I don't have enough time and time and energy at the same time to, to really get into many books uh, beyond my workplace. So if, if you find yourself in that same situation, check out Audible Anarchist. Uh, another good one is, is LibriVox, which Audible Anarchist has col collaborated with LibriVox for a lot of these leftist texts and, and uploaded their collection onto LibriVox. It's a totally free uh, site or, or app that you can put on your phone and you can download just tons of audiobooks. So if, and not, not just politics it's 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 literature anything basically that's in the public domain they, they likely have um if it's you know at least a somewhat well-known title so check them out as well but anyway let's get into uh this essay right now are you an anarchist the answer may surprise you by david graber chances are you have already heard something about who anarchists are and what they are supposed to believe. Chances are, almost everything you have heard is nonsense. Many people seem to think that anarchists are proponents of violence, chaos, and destruction, that they are against all forms of order and organization, or that they are crazed nihilists who just want to blow everything up. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Anarchists are simply people who believe human beings are capable of behaving in a reasonable fashion without having to be forced to. It and that's a sentiment that, that or a sentiment that, that I would agree with. I think that, that left to their own devices, people don't tend to just be violent and, and treacherous towards one another. Uh, if that were the case, it'd be kind of hard for any family to ever, you know, bring children in, into adulthood because think of just the, the family unit uh, like your basic nuclear family. You have two parents who have a lot more knowledge and expertise and, and uh, resources at their disposal, you know, basically infinitely more than, than their children have. If they wanted to, they could just be cruel and, and dominate them and exploit them as much as possible. And while that, that certainly does happen, it's not at all the rule I'd say the rule would be uh, the reverse, where they, they try their best 
you know, as for better or worse, as, as well as they can do to raise their kids with love and caring and, and uh, prepare them for the adult world. It's a very selfless sort of act, right? <laughs> I mean, having kids myself, I can tell you, my kids have made me pretty mad in my lifetime. Uh, perhaps some of the maddest I've, I've been has been when they just, they won't stop like picking at each other. And, you know, uh, they, they just keep, keep after each other. And um, I have to constantly, you know, redirect and redirect and redirect. But it's, you know, obviously it's worth it to, to try and, and bring them to, uh, once they finally reach adulthood, to a place where they can get along with other people. Um, so I think just the, the idea that, that humans are social creatures, that we, that we grow up with our parents, that from the time we're born we are completely helpless and yet we receive help. Uh, obviously infants aren't able to work or, or really produce anything except for good feelings in their parents, if you, if you even call that uh, a form of production. And yet they're cared for, you know, no, no one really leaves infants out in the cold and says, yeah, you know, you're not pulling your weight around here, kid. I, I guess you got to go. That's ridiculous. So I think it's, it's for these things, uh, for these reasons that I, I believe it is kind of in human nature to collaborate, uh, you know, at, at least where we see a, a good reason to do so. When we get, when we th start throwing all these hierarchies together, though, that's when things get, get murky and it becomes less clear why we're working so hard at, a, at our low-wage job, for, for example, to help out a boss that we may have never even met, you know, why we're not ourselves getting ahead. Um, I think that's when, when bad feelings and feelings of, of competitiveness come out, especially among workers themselves, because you don't really have a lot of control about uh, whether or not you move up in a company. You can, you can put your best effort forward, but that's not any guarantee of being rewarded. Um, so what do you have control over? Well, you have control over your coworkers to some degree, especially if you're like a middle-level manager. You can certainly lord it over them. You can stop them from getting other positions that, that they might be able to use against you in the, in the future. So I think it's, it's, it's through these, these artificially imposed hierarchies that, that we get this sense that people are innately competitive and nasty and brutish to one another and, you know, ruthless in, in their climbing up to a, to a better vantage point in their life. So what anarchy tries to do is, is bring things back to, you know, where we all have, we, we all start from a relatively good position. And then no matter what we do throughout our life, we are never able to sink below that, uh, you know, we, we're given the resources just by being alive to continue living and, and living a decent life, basically. But, but let's continue on with the, the essay here. It is really a very simple notion, but it's one that the rich and powerful have always found extremely dangerous. At the very simplest, anarchist beliefs turn on to two elementary assumptions. The first is that human beings are, under ordinary circumstances, you know what? It looks like I, I missed a, a follow there. Four gathers. Thanks very much for the follow. I, I see you must have been doing it when I was doing my intro and running around getting my, my getting every last little detail ready before I did my stream. So thanks very much for the follow. I hope you uh, enjoy what you see and I hope to see you in future streams. Is about as reasonable and decent as they are allowed to be and can organize themselves and their communities without needing to be told how. The second is that power corrupts. Most of all, anarchism is just a matter of having the courage to take the simple principles of common decency that we all live by and to follow them through to their logical conclusions. Odd though this may seem, in most important ways, you are probably already an anarchist. You just don't realize it. Let's start by taking a few examples from everyday life. If there's a line to get on a crowded bus, do you wait your turn and refrain from elbowing your way past others, even in the absence of police? Some people might do that, but I would say by and large, most people understand the, the more or less fairness and, and justice of 
waiting your turn. And it's not just because we're socialized that way. I think it's just something within people that they recognize that if you were at a service first, you should be able to take advantage of that service first. Some people do try and cut in line. Some people are sneaky and very petty in, in small ways. I would think, or I mean, in my experience, I should say, those sorts of people have other stuff going on in their lives and they're feeling the need to lash out and, and hold some little bit of power over others uh, as retribution for whatever slight that they've been given. Still, they may have justice in their mind. It's just that no one else sees it at the time. They're thinking, well, that guy cut me off uh, or that guy cut in line uh, in front of me the other day. So I'm going to, you know, get back at the world that let that happen by cutting in front of someone else. It could be that sort of thing. It could be, you know, a relationship not going well. Well, I'm going to, you know, I don't know what to do with these feelings, so I'm just going to take it out on the next person that I can wield a, a tiny bit of power over. Again, thinking of justice, thinking of fairness and equality, it's just you're not acting it out very well, and you're not, you're maybe being impulsive in the moment, not really thinking it through, and letting uh, bad emotions not be properly dealt with and, and just spew them out on, on whoever may be. Uh, yeah, let's continue. If you answered yes, then you are used to acting like an anarchist. The most basic anarchist principle is self-organization, the assumption that human beings do not need to be threatened with prosecution in order to be able to come to reasonable understandings with each other or to treat each other with dignity and respect. Everyone believes they are capable of behaving reasonably themselves. If they think laws and police are necessary, it is only because they don't believe that other people are. But if you think about it, don't those people all feel exactly the same way about you? Anarchists argue that almost all the antisocial behavior which makes us think it's necessary to have armies, police, prisons, and governments to control our lives is actually caused by the systematic inequalities and injustice those armies, police, prisons, and governments make possible. It's all a vicious circle. If people are used to being treated like their opinions do not matter, they are likely to become angry and cynical, even violent, which of course makes it easy for those in power to say that their opinions do not matter. Once they understand that their opinions really do matter just as much as everyone else's, they tend to become remarkably understanding. To cut a long story short... And, and that's the, the sort of society we're, we're trying to get to, where more people's opinions and, and, and desires and beliefs do matter. The system we have right now is very top-down in its hierarchy. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. I live in the United States. You may live in a country where the, the configuration is, is different, but likely... It's, it's not completely horizontally structured where people have relatively the same amount of power. You probably don't live in, in any sort of anarchist society yet. What anarchists are trying to do, though, is, is put everyone on a level playing field so that more people, or, or, or the most amount of people, can feel that their opinions matter, because they really will matter. If everyone has about an equal say in, in the workings of society, in the workings of their job, uh, in, in just their interpersonal life with, with other humans and, and, and the natural world, then there won't be as much of a need for, for people to feel resentful about someone getting something while they get nothing or, or them working themselves working very hard and not getting rewarded while someone else did. And that breeding resentment too. There, you know, if everyone's getting what they need as well, there's, there's far less need for uh, crime of, of, oh, what's the, it's not crime of opportunity, but it's, it's, it's basically crime to survive, you know, resorting to crime in order to survive because everyone will be on that same level. And again, let's get back to that, that idea of risk. Even if you are a crime minded person, which I, I, I tend to doubt that there's, that most of the people that end up in crime just have some natural proclivity for it. I think they, they wind up doing crime out of, out of necessity or being pushed into it by others or, or basically not just because they think crime is really cool. Um, where was I going with that? So, um, yeah, if, if, if everyone already has 
the things that they need, then there, there's far less need to take that risk and and commit crime to do to get the, the things that you already have. Like it, it doesn't even make sense. Like what, what are you even trying to accomplish at that point? If people are more or less at the, at the same level as you, there's just no reason to, you know, knock over a bank in order to have really nice things because you know you you have the things provided for your life right so so that's another reason to uh move towards a, a more horizontally structured rather than vertically structured sort of society and that's what anarchists want by and large anarchists believe that for the most part it is power itself and the effects of power that make people stupid and irresponsible Are you a member of a club or sports team or any other voluntary organization where decisions are not imposed by one leader but made on the basis of general consent? If you answered yes, then you belong to an organization which works on anarchist principles. Another basic anarchist principle is voluntary association. This is simply a matter of applying democratic principles to ordinary life. The only difference is that anarchists believe it should be possible to have a society in which everything could be organized along these lines, all groups based on the free consent of their members, and therefore that all top-down military styles of organization, like armies or bureaucracies or large corporations based on chains of command, would no longer be necessary. Perhaps you don't believe that would be possible. Perhaps you do. But every time you reach an agreement by consensus, rather than threats, every time you make a voluntary arrangement with another person, come to an understanding, or reach compromise by taking due consideration of the other person's particular situation or needs, you are being an anarchist, even if you don't realize it. Anarchism is just the way people act when they are free to do as they choose, and when they deal with others who are equally free, and therefore, aware of the responsibility to others that entails this so you may be asking why don't people just all decide to behave like that now you know why put up with this this uh system where where things are are not equal why not just say oh if that's how people naturally act how come we aren't moving towards that and the answer is or it typically is that that certain people in society once they have hoarded enough power or, or extra resources or one form of leverage or another over other people, instead of then, you know, sharing that power or, or allowing others to, to rise to the same level, they do whatever they can to maintain their position. So you, you get a business going, you work really hard, and then you get to the point where you can start hiring employees. You know, you may be like, oh, well, I've, I've done the hard work. You know, now my employees are going to take over and I can just kind of kick back and, and run the day to day stuff, you know, ease up a lot. And and in a certain sense, that's true. Everyone, no one should be worked to the bone. I, I think that's something we can probably all agree on. Uh, it, it, it doesn't lead to a good life to be working yourself into, you know, stress ulcers and other medical conditions just to, to try and get ahead. But on, in another sense, you're then taking an easy way out by having other people do your work for you. And then because you happen to be the owner, deciding where that, that profit goes and how it's distributed. And, you know, the big coincidence, you, you uh, as the owner, tend to assign most of the profit to yourself uh, and perhaps other people that you're business partners with. So then at that point, you, you have an advantage. At that point, you might want, you know, to provide for your kids and, and their future, send them to the best schools, get them the best connections. But because only a certain number of people are already ahead, like you are, the, the people that they tend to associate with are going to be other people that, that have been taking advantage of other people in order to get ahead through whatever business they're doing. So they just then are building connections and sharing power with one another amongst the, the owner class and more or less shutting the door behind them because they want to preserve what they have. You know, I've worked too hard for this business to, to, to let it crumble. 
due to, you know, management of the workers or whatever, right? Um, so it's, it's understandable why people, once they achieve power, want to hold on to as much of it as possible, keep on accumulating it, and prevent others from getting it. Uh, however, if we did things the other way, uh, the way that, that does tend more to be the way that, that humans would behave when they're on an equal playing field, then we'll see that we don't need that sort of system. We don't have to push other people down in order to, to get a good life. We can all have a good life. We, we produce enough housing, enough clothing, enough clean water, enough electricity, on and on and on, to provide many times over for everyone's need. There's no reason everyone shouldn't be able to have at least that baseline level of life. We can achieve that now. But it's going to require some people that are taking from the bottom uh, for their own benefit to give up that power. And it's not likely they're going to willingly do it. So, you know, what do you do at that point? Do you, do you cause a revolution? Well, that's, that's, that's itself very risky. And, uh, you know, in, in the chaos that, that can ensue in, in the, the days after a, a large power especially is uh, toppled, maybe the wrong people can, can rush into that vacuum and start trying to seize power themselves. Uh, perhaps it can have cascading effects on, the, on the, the influence that that power has around the world and cause them to be destabilized and cause other horrible things to happen to the, the, the people that, that uh, are over in those situations. The other thing you could do, though, is build alternative networks to help one another at the bottom. Because collectively, we all have a lot more power than we may imagine, especially at the local level. Uh, at the local level, just convincing an entire neighborhood to, to change their vote on an issue could be the difference between an issue passing and not passing. Just getting 50 people together to go rally at the, the uh, city assembly house, whatever, city hall, wherever your, your, uh, wherever your city council meets. Just getting that to happen, that can have an effect. Um, getting out the vote campaigns can be done by people because you don't have to fly people across the country. It's all happening within your own municipality. It takes a, lo a much lower, there's a much lower bar to entry to getting into politics. There's a much lower bar to entry to running a campaign because it's all right there, basically. So with that sort of power, if we were to all decide that this is a good idea, or even a sizable chunk of us, even let's say one neighborhood decides all oh, that this is a great idea, they could conceivably start building those alternative institutions. Uh, they may be, be known as, as a shadow government, which I think is a pretty poor term for it, but, but it just means a, a, a government in everything but, but official name, right? So they may be getting people housing, they may be securing food and, and you know, helping people get better jobs, whatever it is, whatever it is they, they find the need in their community. But they're not doing it as the official local uh, government or any level of official government, for that matter. They're doing it just because they're deciding to do it. And that's the side that I favor more. I think that that, that has a lot more promise, and it, it, it to me it feels a lot more empowering to uh, your average person who, who may feel out of control in their life. That, hey, if just enough of us get together, we can really make a, a big change, uh, especially if you're living in a, a city of any size where you probably can find enough people to talk to that, that will agree with you and perhaps have just a little bit to contribute to. Uh, I like the, the, the story of Stone uh, Soup, which hopefully you're familiar with. You know, the, the, the minstrels come into town, and it's a very selfish and, and untrustworthy city, or, or untrusting city. None, no, one, no neighbors trust each other. They think if you're coming to their door that you must be selling something, uh, no one will open their door to them. So they, they, they get in the middle of the town square, they, they uh, put the, the stone in the soup and say, we're going to make stone soup with everybody. And, and people just, through being intrigued by what the heck these crazy people, or excuse me, these, these strange people are doing, 
uh, they come out and they, they, they look and they say, mm, 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 yes, this is very good stone soup. What it could use, though, is, is a little bit of salt. And then someone says, oh, you know what, I have, I have a little salt. And they come out and, you know, they throw uh, a little bit of vegetables in. And, and little by little, you see just how much people had stashed away, thinking that everyone else was out to get them. And, and by the end of it, of course, they make a, a big stew that's, that's enough for everyone. Neighbors start talking to each other. It's the beginning of a real community forming. So I think, that, I think that's a, a really good parable. Uh, for the, the sort of power that we have to change one another's lives on the community level. And, and, and really it just takes a few people who are dedicated to, to organizing, and it can start in a very small way. You could literally do a stone soup yourself. Uh, you could organize a local food not bombs and just start feeding people because you want people to be fed. I think, I think more than anything it takes will and it takes ingenuity and, and, and a clear vision of, of what you're trying to do. And if you focus on the basic necessities of life and providing that for your community, I think that's a, a wonderful place to start and a place where you can make real change. So I think there's a lot of potential for, for these autonomous movements to, to start up and, and start pulling away from the, the power and, and, and influence of these large governments and, and corporations that, that control basically every aspect of our life right now. But let, let's continue in the, in the book a little bit more. This leads to another crucial point, that while people can be reasonable and considerate when they are dealing with equals, human nature is such that they cannot be trusted to do so when given the power over others. Give someone such power, they will almost invariably abuse it in some way or another. Do you believe that most politicians are selfish, egotistical swine who don't really care about the public interest? Do you think we live in an economic system which is stupid and unfair? If you answered yes, then you subscribe to the anarchist critique of today's society, at least in its broadest outlines. Anarchists believe that power corrupts, and those who spend their entire lives seeking power are the very last people who should have it. Anarchists believe that our present economic system is more likely to reward people for selfish and unscrupulous behavior than for being decent, caring human beings. Most people feel that way. The only difference is that most people don't think there is anything that can be done about it, or any way. And this is what the faithful servants of the powerful... And here's an idea that, that, that just listening to that last passage brought up for me too. If you believe that people are inherently selfish, self-serving, uh, violent towards one another, willing to dominate one another, uh, given half a chance, if you really believe in the worst of human nature, wouldn't you still then want to set up a society in a way where no one has enough power to do that? Wouldn't that be the best safeguard against such people getting into powerful, powerful positions because there wouldn't be the same level of powerful positions available to them? Why would you then want a society like we have now where those sorts of people can and often are rewarded? They, they, they found that among CEOs, there's, there's a higher than average chance of them scoring poorly on, uh, what is that, like the, the dark triad score, or, you know, the, 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 the test that's supposed to, to show whether or not you're a, a psychopath, which is not a clinical term, but still a useful way to describe someone that, that has very little empathy or care for, for other humans, is ruthless, will, will push their way to the top, uh, whatever the cost. They've found that among CEOs and other high-powered positions, there's, there's a, a much higher than average chance. I think it's, it's probably true that, that more often than not, these people that seek power are people that have no qualms about wielding power however they feel uh, and, and however gets them as far ahead. Like, I mean, it makes perfect sense. If you want to have a situation that benefits you at the expense of everyone else, you might feel bad about that if you have a lot of empathy towards other people. If you don't have empathy, you might not feel so bad and you might not have any reservations about doing whatever it takes to get into that position. I wouldn't be surprised if, if most people at the federal level in, in say, Congress or, or the presidency also exhibit a, a good number of psychopathic traits, or would at least if they were ever given a real psychological evaluation. And I think that the, the, the technical term is... is uh, 
you know, something like borderline, oh, is it borderline personality or is it narcissistic? Oh man, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Anyway, they, they would exhibit the, the traits that, that go along with not being able to empathize with others or really form, you know, strong emotional bonds with others. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a very strong correlation with that. So having said that, why would you want that society if you don't want those people to be in power, right? Why wouldn't you instead want a society where power is spread out as much as possible so those psychopaths, no matter how hard they try, cannot get large amounts of power over other people and do things like, oh, say, dump uh, uh, coal mine tailings into a local waterway, poisoning it for hundreds of miles, or... Uh, you know, do any of the number of things that, that, that come up every year that, that these companies get um, found guilty of, uh, acting in their own interest at the expense of the public in one way or another. It makes more sense to me to have a more flattened society in terms of power. Because even, even if you believe, yeah, like I said, even if you believe in the worst in people, uh, and, and to be sure, even if you believe in the best in people overall, you still have to realize that there are people that will do bad things. You don't want those people to be in, in, in positions of power either. So whether you believe in the worst or you believe in the best in people, it seems to make the most sense to me to, to do our best as a collective society to keep those people away from, from any sort of leverage they could get over others to hurt them. It just makes sense to me more are most likely to insist anything that won't end up making things even worse. Well, what if that weren't true? And is there really any reason to believe this? When you can actually test them, most of the usual predictions about what would happen without states or capitalism turn out to be entirely untrue. For thousands of years, people lived without governments. In many parts of the world, people live outside the control of governments today. They do not all kill each other. Mostly, they just get on about their lives, the same as anyone else would. True. Think about all the, the very rural areas in the United States. The U.S. Is, is a very rural country overall. Uh, we, we haven't had the, the same generational crowding that, that places like Europe have had, building things up on top of each other year after year, or, or other places that have been, uh, you know, where there's been just large concentrations of people for a long time. For, for all intents and purposes, a lot of these rural areas are ungoverned. Uh, they, they, they are just left to their own devices. You, you may never see a sheriff drive by or maybe once in a very long while. Uh, and yet, people aren't just you know, left and right hacking each other to death or, or, or um, turning people into their, their slaves or, or doing any other sort of atrocity to one another. They, they just live their lives. Look at, look at rich neighborhoods. Rich neighborhoods, even in, in major cities. I, I work in a lot of those neighborhoods doing landscaping. Uh, you don't see police around. You don't even see private security, hardly. People may have, you know, alarm systems and stuff like that, but, you know, if, if people were really that, that dastardly just by nature, uh, why are they not trying to get one over on each other? Why do they seem pretty happy and, and content and, and safe when they're walking around their neighborhoods? Go to any neighborhood, any, any neighborhood that, that's middle class or above. As, as long as you don't stick out in some way and, and you know, give reason, well, not reason, but in their minds, give reason to, to be suspicious of you. But as long as they think that you are belonging there, you'll see very placid, content people who are not trying to harm one another. They may have disputes about like, you know, oh, your bush is growing over my fence and, and you're always playing your music too loud. I mean, I'm not talking about these low level things. I'm talking about actual long term damage. Why are they not hurting each other? I would say the reason is because they're all basically on the same level. And they all basically have their, their needs met for, you, for themselves. They're not worried about baseline survival. You take away one of those two factors, 
and that's where you get to to people dominating one another, people being violent, nasty, suspicious of one another. Uh, so let's instead make a society where people are more or less on the same level. You don't allow hoarding, and you don't allow people to, to go homeless unless they really, really want to. Uh, I think that would solve a lot of problems, you know. And it, it, you know, and this this doesn't matter across any other sort of dividing line, you know, um, uh, uh, race or or ethnicity, uh, origin, all that stuff. If people see you as on the same level as them, they will get along with you just fine. That's that's. I, I mean, I, I defy you to find circumstances where that's not true. I, I, as long as again both parties are, are having their needs met. If they're not, then they may come up with reasons to, to not like one another, but that's beside the point. Of course, in a complex, urban, technological society, all this would be more complicated, but technology can also make all these problems a lot easier to solve. In fact, we've not even begun to think about what our lives could be like if technology were really marshaled to fit human needs. How many hours would we really need to work in order to maintain a functional society? That is, if we got rid of all the useless or destructive occupations like telemarketers, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> prison guards, financial analysts, public relation experts, bureaucrats, and politicians. Uh, that's funny that he, he makes that list there because a lot of those people, I think, uh, bureaucrats. Well, well, bureaucrats too. But, but maybe politicians are left out when, when we get into the, the next video we're going to cover. His, his essay uh, on the phenomenon of, of bullshit jobs. This, is, this will also be another one by David Graeber, which he then turned into a phenomenal book. It's, it's really opened my eyes about a lot of things. Uh, I think it's probably my favorite book that I've read this year. It's, it's, it's just really great. But, but he lists that whole uh, litany of people who don't really do much of anything, who are just performing useless tasks in society. Uh, and he's like, well, why don't we just get rid of them and, and pay them as though they were going to work, right? It, it, it would have the same effect, except for it would free them up to, to do a lot more productive things with their time and their life, you know, productive in their own terms, right? No one's going to decide to be an, a telemarketer. It's only a job you do if you feel like you have to. It also doesn't really do much for society. Uh, in fact, the things you're selling oftentimes are things that, that are borderline scams, uh, I mean, it could be really scams if you get into like the, the multi-level marketing stuff, but even just like novelties and, and insurance that, that people don't need, it's, it's, it's all the stuff that doesn't really help society in any measurable way, as defined by the people that, that even do those jobs. Uh, so let's just get rid of them, <laughs> pay, pay, pay them, you know, the same wage or, or at least a livable wage, actually and then free them up to do better things with their time. It's a, it's a win-win for everybody involved. And turn our best scientific minds away from working on space weaponry or stock market systems to mechanizing away dangerous or annoying tasks like coal mining or cleaning the bathroom and distribute the remaining work among everyone equally, five hours a day, four, three, two? No one knows because no one is even asking this kind of question. Anarchists think these are the very questions we should be asking. Do you really believe those things that you tell your children or that your parents told you? It doesn't matter who started it. Two wrongs don't make a right. Clean up your own mess. Do unto others. Don't be mean to the people just because they're different. Perhaps we should decide whether we're lying to our children when we tell them about right and wrong, or whether we're willing to take our own injunctions seriously. Because if you take these moral principles to their logical conclusions, you arrive at anarchism. Take the principle of two wrongs don't make a right. If you really took it seriously, that alone would knock away almost the entire basis for war and the criminal justice system. The same goes for sharing. We're always telling our children that they have to learn to share, to be considerate of each other's needs, to help each other. Then we go off into the real world, where we assume that everyone is naturally selfish and competitive. 
But an anarchist would point out, in fact, what we say to our children is right. Pretty much every great worthwhile achievement in human history, every discovery or accomplishment that's improved their lives has been based on cooperation and mutual aid. Even now, most of us spend more of our money on our friends and families than on ourselves. So isn't that a funny dance that we do in, in internally in our own lives? We, we treat people with uh, kindness, with, with deference. Uh, we, we help children that need help. We help friends that need help. We don't ask, well, what, you know, what, what have you done for me lately? I mean, some of us might, but, but by and large, I don't think that's the case. I think probably most people, at least if, you've, you've, if you are 30 years old or, or, or more, have helped friends move, you know, with, with maybe nothing more than the promise of, of a slice of pizza or, or a cold beverage or something like that. Did you, did you ask them, well, you know, I'm not sure I'm really profiting in this relationship? No, you didn't. And the same thing with your kids. You, you teach them all these values that he listed. Cooperation, fairness. And, and yet, if everyone is doing that internally in, in their internal lives, why do we then all assume that things are flipped in the quote-unquote real world? It's kind of bizarre, isn't it? It's kind of bizarre how we all pretend, well, or, or probably just are not aware, or maybe just don't ever think about it, that if we're teaching our children this stuff, and if we're treating our friends this way, that that's the norm. And that we could all be doing that both in our internal lives and as a society as a whole. There's nothing that says that we couldn't do things that way. Again, it's, it's my opinion that just these, these people that have managed to, to seize one lever of power or another have, have convinced us otherwise. And it's not some nefarious plot. I'm sure they convinced themselves, too, that, that, that everyone's just coming for them. You know, they only got ahead by being ruthless, and that's just the way of the world. On and on and on. So they just assume that that's, the, that's how things are. Uh, but I, I would bet that even them, by and large, are, are you know, charitable, friendly, uh, you know, willing to render mutual aid to to friends as well, you know, well, you know, give them something without any any thought of, of getting something in return, other than just satisfaction of of you know increasing the bonds of friendship. So yeah, let's let's think more about that as we go throughout our lives. Think about the, the sort of values that you would want, whether or not you have kids, whether or not you ever want to have kids. Think about the sort of values you would want them to have if you did. And then let's, let's start talking with one another about those things. And, and ask the question to them too. Why, does it, why is it only that way here, but not in the rest of the world? How could we, we bring the best parts of, of our internal lives, our, our friend group, our, our family members, and the way we treat them, and bring it out into the real world? How can we, how can we move forward with that if, if that's what we really believe in? And if, if we all just kind of come to this understanding on our own that that's a good thing, these ideas of sharing and, and, and caring for one another, uh, why not try and remake society in that way? While likely as not, there will always be competitive people in the world, there is no reason why society has to be based on encouraging such behavior, let alone making people compete over the basic necessities of life. That only serves the interests of people in power who want us to live in fear of one another. That's why anarchists call for a society based not only on free association, but mutual aid. The fact is, that most children grow up behaving in anarchist morality, then gradually have to realize that the adult world doesn't really work that way. That's why so many become rebellious or alienated, even suicidal as adolescents, and finally resigned and bitter as adults. So, so he's arguing here that we're, we're brought up with this, this sort of, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, 
help each other out even if you you don't think that the person deserves it or you're angry at them right now because we're family or it's your friends or whatever and then they get out into uh, an independent life of their own and they see that 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 things are are functionally very different than that and they become embittered and they they feel lied to and and so they they come to the conclusion that that no the world cannot be that way because look at it now it, all those things that I, I i grew up learning turned out not to be true but I, if you if you would just flip that and say those those things that i learned as a kid they did work when i was a kid as well i mean hopefully hopefully you had a a, a decent childhood where you you had supportive parents and and uh, friends that you could count on that sort of a thing did work back then, probably. And if it didn't for you individually, I would say that overall, that, that tends to be how it does work for, for people. Uh, otherwise, a lot less children would make it to society as any kind of functional adult, right? If they were just beaten down that much and taken advantage of that much, they, they would not be likely to be a functioning member of society. And that does happen, but but by and large, it doesn't. By and large, you you know, you have a certain amount of protection and and support as a child, and then when you get out into again the real world, somehow that all goes away. But we don't have to leave it back there in childhood. We we could bring it into adulthood as well. We could we could care about each other just as fellow human beings, fellow citizens of the same city fellow just you know humans on earth as uh, you know the same way that we we did about childhood friends or or that family cared about us and provided for us uh there's 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 nothing stopping it other than the the inability to to or the the unwillingness to see that it's possible and enough people just getting together and deciding that they want to actually make it happen that way their only solace often being the ability to raise children of their own and pretend to them that the world is fair. But what if we could really start to build a world which really was at least founded on principles of justice? Wouldn't that be the greatest gift to one's children one could possibly give? Do you believe that humans are fundamentally corrupt and evil or that certain sorts of people, women, people of color, ordinary folk, who are not rich or highly educated are inferior specimens destined to be ruled by their betters? If you answered yes, then, well, it looks like you aren't an anarchist after all. But if you answered no, then chances are you already subscribe to 90% of anarchist principles. And this, this, this tends to be the test that, that is used to determine whether someone is likely to be conservative or liberal. Which is kind of funny because, at least in America, liberals are still technically on the, the right side of the political spectrum. Because they still believe in a system that inherently is top-down, pyramidal, and, and dependent on exploiting the workers for the benefit of the owners. As well as other people around the world for the, the benefit of everyone in society. To, to get those cheap goods to market, to, to get that cheap labor to make those goods uh, so on so, uh, to perform services such as, as as like the telemarketing that was mentioned earlier stuff like that so people that 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 tend to believe that there's just a natural order to things some some people are just born better than others and uh, therefore should get or, you know are deserving of, of all the best in life that tends to fall on the conservative side people that believe that that people are more or less equal there's more or less an equal distribution of, of talent in any given field or, or, or discipline, regardless of, of any sort of circumstances of, of birth or upbringing that, that people just naturally have relatively the same levels. Um, you know, and, you know, you might be really good at, at science and not so good at, at, at uh, humanities or it may be the reverse, but, but, but still, by and large, there's, there's something that everyone is good at and its distribution among peoples has nothing to do with any inherent essential 
characteristic of one group or another. Uh, that egalitarianism is something that, that should be strived for, um, that, that help should be given to people that, that need it, uh, these sorts of things. As he said, you're already most of the way there towards a, an actual leftist, and he says anarchist, but, but really any leftist sort of view. These are the things, that's what distinguishes left from right more than anything. Do you believe in an essentialist view of the world? Essentially, this group of people are superior uh, and they deserve to be ruling. And, and if you are not in that group and you are less fortunate, you deserve it. Or do you believe that people are more or less the same? They more or less want the same things and deserve the same things. And just through some misfortune of not being born in the right place, the right time, the right skin color, the right gender, the right sexuality, whatever, they are just not having the right uh, care and support in their upbringing, uh, you know, whether that's through uh, a lack of, of uh, family support or a lack of, of school support or whatever have you, that these are the things that determine where people end up more so than any inherent essential characteristics of them. If you believe in the latter, then that puts you more towards the left. So to me, that gives me hope. That gives me hope that, that, that people that call themselves liberals or progressives or, or even uh, social democrats, people that want sort of a, a, a Scandinavian system, still can be convinced that, that at the core of what they believe, uh, that core fits better with actual leftism than it does with capitalism or any sort of right ideology that, that believes in strict hierarchies and, you know, order at all costs. So that gives me hope that, that those people can be swayed, uh, perhaps just through a little bit of, of extra thinking or, or, or being exposed to materials they haven't been exposed to yet through whatever reason. Maybe it was stigmatized. I know that was the case with me. Uh, in, in, in high school, anytime something like, uh, you know, we read, we read Animal Farm, we read 1984, and even if it wasn't necessarily uh, explicit, the, the implication was always that the, the sort of, um, uh, that, that communism or any sort of left ideology inevitably leads to totalitarianism and, and greater human misery and that the West is, is uh, and the, the liberal democracies of the world are far better in every respect. So that, to me, that stigmatized things and I didn't really explore you know, actual leftist thought until just a couple of years ago and didn't really start, hadn't really started questioning uh, the idea that, you know, say the, the Scandinavian liberal democracy was the, the most we could hope for. I didn't, I didn't question that idea until, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, and, and, and like I said, it, it took me that long to even come around from that point. But had it just been posited to me, like, like given to me as, as something that's even possible, that, that these other sort of systems, no matter how they ended up playing out in the real world, uh, that this is what they even believe. Like, like I mean, you see still, uh, especially conservatives have a lot of difficulty defining what, what even something as simple as socialism is. They say it's the government owning and, and doing things, and they want control over every aspect of your life. It's, it's always about control and government and, and, and these other big boogeymen that they throw out. And whether they're just not curious enough to, to learn the actual meaning, um, whether they are just being disingenuous and, and saying that in order to score political points for their side, it doesn't really matter. It's just that that seems to be more or less... Uh, agreed upon even by people on the liberal, liberal side that capitalism good anything else bad and that we, we've we've arrived at the best system for human progress and and uh, well-being that, that we're ever going to hope to to encounter and I think it just ain't true it's, it's just not and and I've only been been more hardened in my belief in that uh, through talking with other people uh, and, and reading the, this sort of theory. So 
that's a big reason why I do this and a big reason why I just try to get the ideas out there without presenting them as, as being scary or something that you have to be all in on and, or, or else you're a, you're a bad comrade or any of that sort of thing. I like to give people space to breathe because it's a lot of, really, for most people, it's a lot of deprogramming that has to occur to get them even to the point where they're, they're able to to uh, consider, you know, seriously entertain any sort of alternative to capitalism. It, it, that's how interwoven into our lives and our psyches the, the, the system is. Um, so I feel that, that a softer touch, uh, a softer push towards, towards the left is going to be more effective in the long run than, than just, you know, chiding people into all or nothing sort of politics or expecting people to get up to speed when all the rest of their training throughout their life has, has been pushing them in the other direction. Let's give people space to breathe, really. And likely as not, are living your life largely in accord with them. Every time you treat another human being with consideration and respect, you are being an anarchist. Every time you work out your differences with others by coming to reasonable compromise, listening to what everyone has to say rather than letting one person decide for everyone else, you are being an anarchist. Every time you have the opportunity to force someone to do something but decide to appeal to their sense of reason or justice instead, you are being an anarchist. The same goes for every time you share something with a friend or decide who is going to do the dishes or do anything at all with an eye of fairness. Now, you might object that all this is well and good as way for small groups of people to get on with each other, but managing a city or a country is an entirely different matter. And of course, there is something to this. Even if you decentralize society and put as much power as possible in the hands of small communities, there will still be plenty of things that need to be coordinated, from running railroads to deciding on directions for medical research. But just because something is complicated does not mean that there is no way to do it democratically. It would just be complicated. In fact... And, and another thing, just because economically things may be made to be more democratically doesn't mean that socially we will just automatically be on the same level. That might be the case on a very long time scale. We may trend in that direction, but say if if socialism were implemented tomorrow in the united states that's not going to be the end of racism or transphobia or or homophobia any of these other phobias uh, or prejudices there's there's more to it than just a power dynamic because poor white people can be just as racist as or just as prejudiced i should say as uh, rich white people, they may not have the power to act on it, so they may not, you know, racism might be, not be the, the best term, but they can simply, ha they, they can certainly have as much hatred in their heart for people that are different as uh, the richest of people. And there can be all sorts of racial animosities or, or different phobias that, that can still happen, even if people are becoming more equal. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind as well. And, and that's one reason that I think intersectionality is so important when we're talking about rebuilding and remaking society. We can't just focus on class antagonisms between workers and owners, or the rich and the poor, or, or what have you. Those may be some of the most important uh, wrongs to right, but they're not the only ones. And... It's, it's still going to be a significant thing after any sort of remake of society uh, to, to deal with these other sorts of issues. And at the same time, if someone might not be as open to a leftist idea as, as you might like them to, by being intersectional, you can help relate your ideas to their lived experience. If you have experienced economic inequalities, if you, if you grew up in a, in a uh, poor school district, you might be able to relate to someone that, that has experienced another form of being left behind, being looked down upon, 
being judged. If you just want things to be more equitable and you haven't experienced that yourself, that still can be a way to begin to, to help them understand that, that these, these struggles are linked and, and in many cases they reinforce each other. There's, there's a great series called uh, Seeing White. It was put out by Seen on Radio. Really great podcast series. I've, I mentioned it a while back on the stream. Uh, like probably when I was starting my first book on stream. And it, it goes through the history of whiteness and, and how it was created primarily as a tool to decide who gets stuff and who doesn't. And then as a tool to pit one group of the lower class against another group or the working class against another group of the working class and say oh, oh hey you know newly arrived Irish people look at those black people and how they're they're gonna compete with you for these these limited jobs in the the factories you're not gonna let that happen you got to provide for your own it, it, it was created this idea of whiteness and who was able to be white was often manipulated for that cause when the Irish first arrived, they were not considered white. Same thing with the Italians, uh, with, the, with other Mediterranean uh, ethnicities. Not considered white when they first arrived to the U.S. It's only when it became politically advantageous to pit one against the other that they'd say, well, you're the, the favored working class because you look somewhat similar to us. And we have to rally against this other working set of working class people because they look different. You don't want to trust them, right? keeps people fighting each other so so race is very much already intersectional with class uh, it's 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 one of the biggest problems that that racism uh, and, and white supremacy uh, put out into the world or, 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 or perpetuate that, that's a better word for it uh, uh, the idea that that people are being kept down simply because they look different and are thought of as, as different or lesser than. And that's justification in a lot of people's minds in, in them staying proportionally more impoverished than other groups that are more favored. So that's another reason to, to bring in intersectionality. Uh, but yeah, let's continue on in the, in, the, in the essay here. I think we're, yeah, almost done here. Anarchists have all sorts of different ideas and visions about how a complex society might manage itself. To explain them, though, would go far beyond the scope of a little introductory text like this. Suffice it to say, first of all, that a lot of people have spent a lot of time coming up with models for how a really democratic, healthy society might work. But second, and just as importantly, no anarchist claims to have a perfect blueprint. The last thing we want is to impose prefab models on society anyway. The truth is, we probably can't even imagine half the problems that will come up when we try to create a democratic society. Still, we're confident that, human ingenuity being what it is, such problems can always be solved, so long as it is in the spirit of our basic principles, which are, in the final analysis, simply the principles of fundamental human decency. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. So there you have it. Wonderful service, Audible Anarchist. I'm so, so happy that it exists and that it's, it's able to put this stuff out to, to so many people. Because I think this is, is vital stuff to, to start thinking about. Even this introductory stuff. You know, it's important just to get people thinking. Perhaps you already believe in, in some flavor of leftism. Perhaps you believe in anarchy already. And, and you are looking for a good way to explain things to people that, that are uninitiated into this sort of way of thinking, this might be a good resource for you to point to. Uh, you might want to point to, to my video, I, I would hope. I hope I've, I've added some, some context and some, some ideas to what's already out there. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, important stuff to get through either way. So that was... Are you an anarchist? And, and the, the idea was just to start thinking about uh, ideas of anarchy uh, and whether or not that fits your, your already established worldview. 
and, and how you view society, how you view fairness and, and hierarchy and justice and all these sorts of things. And does that fit in with, with the, the big scary word anarchy?